Hello Radio World, this is Daniel, and this is Megan, and you are listening to another episode of Grave Breaches. Are we on episode four? Episode Cinco. Uno, dos, three, squatro. Episode Quattro. <laughs> what was I saying? Episode four. <laughs> yes. Episode four. Episode okay, four. So I was correct. Looks like we made it. You know, what, you know what they say in the podcast world, when you make it to four, next is five. Is that what they say? That's what I've been told from podcasters. How many podcasters do you know personally? None. You and me. Yeah, that's personally. what I thought. You know what? I was already thinking about it. Perfect segue. I'm going to jump on it. little plug here. Not the drug kind, but the new, the announcement kind. Um, you know, some people have talked to us about the historical they how they're getting something histo- like at the history of these episodes you know anyways if you if you're listening to this and you're like yeah the, this is neat and all but i actually just want the history part not the the gruesome war crime part dan carlin's hardcore history has got to be like one of the best pot like i love he he does a great podcast just go search hardcore history is very interesting. It is out of this world. And if you just like the, I mean, if we're going to plug other uh, podcasters, <laughs> if you just like the gruesome crime plugged. part, I personally really enjoy Red Handed. That uh, is a good Hannah one. Hannah and Surati are uh, two, two British women who I just really enjoy listening to their accents, but they also do a really good job. Well, and, you know, let me piggyback off of that. Uh, yeah, obviously, with Megan being so addicted to them, I hear things. They're my favorite. Yeah, they really, they are, really are from great. Your podcast, but what's the other one you listen to that's on YouTube? Uh, I listen to Bailey Sarian. That's the one. Is that who you're thinking yeah. of? I do love her too. She's a good. Yeah, she does the Murder Mystery Monday. I think is I'm saying she... that correctly, but she also does Dark History podcast, which I really enjoy. Is she just on YouTube? Or... No, she does the she does that Dark History podcast that I'm subscribed to as well. Okay, that's on Apple and and maybe Spotify. I'm not sure. I listen to it on Apple. Well, so. yeah, those are all, all three good ones. So whichever yeah. side of the fence you know, you're on. There's a couple there that we just listed that you could enjoy other than us um, that are much more professional than we are, but doing it much longer than we have and know probably a little more than we do. So there's that. Um, I wonder if they stress about audio every episode. <laughs> probably not anymore. Probably not, which I'm jealous. I'm sure we'll get we'll there. We'll get there. Yeah, we'll get there, hopefully. Well, um, this episode... Last week, we kind of ended on, I don't want to say controversial, but like you and I had discussed taking some stuff out. Yeah. And I was like, man, we got to leave it raw. Like this, I feel like that's what this is about. Just rawness, right? Um, but yeah. anyways, if you if you can recall from a week ago, or unless you're, you're binge listening, uh, last episode we ended on like something about just to reference flash what's that called on a on a tv show flashback yeah flashback just something i don't know what the context was but somehow i just really wanted to kill somebody my first appointment yeah and i wish i had just added a little bit like i don't want people hearing this and thinking well that's how they all are because obviously our topic in this whole podcast is war crimes and daniel's here talking about how he just wanted to kill somebody there's I think the there's a level of professionalism that comes into play when that goes out the window. Does that make any sense? Like that was because I was a kid, yeah, and it was just my own personal desire in that moment. But like my NCOs and my platoon, like man, dude, some like the professionals of the group and. It, in the military, and if you're listening, you were in the military, you already know, like, NCOs are always getting in trouble for what their guys do. And I used to think, like, how stupid is that? But, like, you're, whether they're your Marines, your soldiers, your sailors, your airmen, your Coast Guardsmen, whatever it is, like, they really are a reflection of you and and how just how well you have a handle and relationship rapport with those guys. So my long, I'm going to get there eventually, (laughs) sorry, but it just, 
my NCOs set the tone. Our platoon commander set the tone. And it's because of those absolute professionals we weren't just going around killing every living being in our AO. Yeah, it needs to be noted that there was a lot of uh, lack of frontal lobe development. These were very young guys. These are very young guys. Y'all go and we've discussed this before and I think our first episode. Y'all yeah. go into this, I think, kind of picturing like, am I wrong in saying like Call of Duty, I don't know, war movie type pictures in your head? And you kind of need to be reeled in. Is that too far to say? That is not an accurate. I, I, well, it is. It is funny you brought that up. Um, thinking about just how naive, absolutely naive. Yeah. Like, because, you know, you go through, you know, there's a workup. There's training. Like, it's not like I graduated boot camp and bam, I'm flying overseas or any anybody is for that matter. Yeah. So, like, training, tactics, um, just everything that goes with what you're me doing over there. Like, that's repetitive. That's muscle memory. That's etched into your brain. You can do it in your sleep. But just <laughs> every day of just what is actually going to happen, I don't know. Well, you have to remember, like, I wasn't going to go talk to my NCOs. Like, I knew if I caught them in the barracks, I was getting thrashed. So, like, I didn't go ask them, like, <laughs> hey, what should I expect? But, like, I remember landing. I don't remember, remember where we landed, but I was thinking, like, man – I'm really upset I don't have my Kevlar because we, we might be getting shot as soon as we step off the plane. And that was so stupid. Was naive. Yeah, like I really... feel so dumb. I've never even told anybody that's how I felt because that's how embarrassing it but is. But I could see that if you didn't know what you were expecting. Yeah. I mean, feeling that way. Well, um, yeah, it just, you, you know your job, you know what to do. Mm-hmm. In the situations you train for, you just don't know when those situations are going to present themselves. And obviously, yeah. you get in the country and you start, you know, going on missions and stuff, and it falls into place. But no one prepares you. You know, they don't care. Like, you're safe. You know, you're in, like, you're in a safe place. So they don't know, hey, when we first get there. But they don't give a crap what you're thinking. They only care about, and I hate to say that. I had, again, great NCOs. Like, I knew, I knew they cared about me, but it wasn't. They weren't. Teddy bears, um, you know, obviously being eating, sleeping, operating every, everything, like every minute of your life for seven months, like you grow closer to those guys. But, yeah. um, anyway, oh, okay. So professionalism, we, so this, I know we're only on episode four, but we had not done a war crime that involved Marines. Mm-hmm. Which is a thing. And speaking on that professionalism thing, we had not done a war crime that brought in any special forces unit, mm-hmm. the SOCOM community. Yeah. So I, please don't forget to do this. I'm going to say it right now. I should have already done it. Do not start this episode unless you can listen to the end. And to tell you what, if you start this and you're like, this is crap, I hate it. Fast forward to the end because you really do have to hear the end to not lose your mind with this episode. There's a twist at the end. Could we say that or is that? Um, I don't even know because, again, Daniel researches this. This is not one. I still haven't started researching them yet, so I don't know for sure. A one-eighth twist, yeah. Okay. So, So, again, bear with us or just skip to the end, but don't see the title. Or start it. Don't make then, assumptions. Yeah. Assumptions are bad. We should never make assumptions. Yeah, that's get me in a Don't lot do of that. trouble. Don't ever make assumptions. Never a good thing. Yeah. All right. Should we say the episode title? We haven't. Should we? I, we should. We should have we? not. I think we should. It's been a long time coming. I mean, they've read it already. Oh, yeah. It's so. Task Force Violent. Okay. So right at the gate, you're like, what are we getting oh, into? Yeah. Violent. Very interesting. Violence. Violence. Yeah. Task Force. Task Force force violent Mm. uh this is gonna be on a marsoc 
company. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that because I didn't know. Do I say the individual letters? Do I say mm-hmm. the whole thing? Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> For being married no. to Maureen, I'm not positive of all the things. Well, uh, the story starts off with, and I think you're going to see some common trends when we bring individuals into the story. Yeah. So uh, the, the company commander, his name was Fred Galvin, and he grew up in Kansas City, which I didn't realize was such a, it's like a pretty, pretty rough place. Really? It's, yeah. It's, I didn't know that. I mean, I did not either, but it's, yeah, it's not a good place. Um, had an abusive father. Okay. So he grew up, you know, getting beat up by his dad, like having to basically protect him and his mom as best he could. Mm. And that's what I'm saying. I feel like that's a common trend with what we're getting into because I know with our first episode, there was a whole lot of red flags there in the beginning, right? Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, So, Fred Galvin, let's get into this unit. In 2006, he was selected to lead the first MARSOC unit in combat. So, MARSOC is kind of like the Navy SEALs of the Marine Corps. And this is a new thing. MARSOC, I want to say, was... Well, not that new. It's 2006. That age is I know, like we're that old. Feels. We're old. Yeah. So, but, I mean, in comparison, obviously, like, SEALs yeah. have been around since, I, I know the Frogmen were in World War Two, and then the armies. But, in, had, yeah, okay, fair enough, in yeah. comparison. Yeah, but but certainly to this this war crime. Okay. I mean, very, very, very So new. it was new in 2006. Well, so the story we're going over is their first deployment okay. as a unit. Ever. Okay. But what I don't want to get lost in translation is this is not these Marines' first deployment. Okay. These are like tier one operate. Like they are experienced. They are combat veterans. This isn't their first deployment. But as this MARSOC unit, it's mm-hmm. the first of its kind, like it, that, as a unit, it's their first deployment. Okay. Following. Okay, so Major, he was Major Galvin when he's assigned um, of Marine, Mars, like I'm sorry, Marine Special Operations, um, Marine Special Operations Command, Marsoc. Uh, and the company he was given command was Foxtrot Company. Mm-hmm. So he was given command of this whole company. Um, and one of the, I think they were generals, maybe there's a full bird colonel, but to investigate this crime there's pretty much they created a, a, a panel of um officers to review this and one of the things that one of these officers said about these marines was they were superbly prepared for tactical employment but fox company was shipped out undermanned under equipped and woefully woefully underprepared for the political environment they encountered on the ground in Afghanistan. And to put that in perspective, they had a single Uno, just one, one mechanic for 45 vehicles. So I'm hearing that as they were well-trained Marines. Oh, yeah. They had been trained to the best of anybody's ability, but they were not equipped properly. Correct. Man, that sounds slightly familiar. Coming from the profession that I'm in, and I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, I mean, again, one mechanic for 45 vehicles. That's ridiculous. Yeah, that's every, and you have to remember, like, no, this isn't just, like, old changes and whatever. This is everything that a ve- can go wrong. You know, they're going out on missions, going through rough terrain, getting shot at, blown up. Like, everything, ordering parts acquiring parts putting the parts on taking the parts off uh just regular maintenance this one dude is just is doing crushing it. it and they don't say his name but just tip of the hat to this young marine like apparently did a phenomenal job yeah even though he was doing it all on his own yeah wow all right so during their workup command took note of their shortcomings and sent options up the chain of command These were their options. Number one, the heavy package. With 19 personnel, Fox Company could sustain 24-7 mission capability. So 19 support personnel. Yeah. What does that mean? Like the admin and the mechanics and the... Okay. So not actual Marines on the ground. No, no, no. Yeah. So their company is already established by this point. These packages that you're reading off are... This is what our company of Marines needs as a, an attachment to sustain to be them su- in successful. Afghanistan. Yes. Okay. 
All right. So that was the heavy package with 19 support personnel. So they need 19 support personnel for the heavy package. Yeah. So number two, the medium package with 16 support personnel, the unit could sustain mission missions lasting up to four days. So that's a huge difference just with that short, with that small amount of... Like, oh, with a th- yeah, I yeah, thought so too. Like people three missing. people, four, yeah. So I wonder. Hmm. I really wish I could have found out like what these nineteen or sixteen or support exactly personnel are. are. For, yeah, because yeah. that's interesting. Just three makes such a difference. All right, number three, the light package with thirteen support personnel. Fox Company could sustain missions lasting two days. So again, just a, a small amount. This is a little bit more, makes a little more sense though. Going from 24-7 to, you know, oh, yeah. four is huge, but that makes, I guess, more sense. All right, then uh, number four, the bare minimum. This plan called for six support personnel. Anything less and Fox Company would be unable to sustain itself in theater without outside help, they said. And remember how many they got. Yeah. mm Galvin never stopped fighting for his Marines and was reprimanded for freelancing supplies. What does that mean exactly? So they did not get the support of any of these packages. So they had no support. Yeah, well, they're mechanic. No support personnel. They're mechanic. They're one mechanic. And, you know, maybe someone fell through the cracks, but just from what I'm able to gather. That's what they had. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he was out here, like, free to... <laughs> it blows my mind, like... Cause, being who I was in the big scheme of things, like it's something I never thought of. I know we had to like um, ration water once, yeah. But uh, just being, especially being on like a fob, I never in my mind to like think about like, are we gonna get fed? But he and was out here freelancing. Like, could you tell our listeners what a fob is? Ford operating base. Okay. So it's you know there's. Big bases, and then they'll go build up a base, which a fob to me is pretty big too. Yeah. Um, but they'll build, you know, big major hubs. Maybe has an airstrip or somewhere where helicopters or planes can fly into. And then there's fobs that can reach further out and get away from that big hub. But it's, you know, so it's pretty much just another smaller base. Okay. But yeah, he was out here having like for everything like for food. It. Like, everything. And he was reprimanded for this? Yeah, he got in trouble for... Because, you know, there's there's an email chain. And it, I get it. Like, it makes people look bad. But at the same time, like, hey, if you weren't absolutely shafting us, you wouldn't look bad. I say you're looking bad because you're not taking care of your Marines. Yeah. They're going hungry or whatever else, missing equipment that they need. Yeah, it was kind of ridiculous. Pretty ridiculous. There's going to be some frustrating aspects to this. They weren't set up for success by any means. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. So, you know, they get out. So we're talking about all the shortcomings leading up to this. Mm. These guys, and you think like MARSOC, like these are the tip of the absolute spear, like special forces of the Marine Corps. And they're having to deal with all this stuff. They didn't know what theater they were deploying to until they got on ship. So they were part of a muse. So, yeah, they went on. They got there by ship. They didn't know if they were going to Iraq or Afghanistan, maybe even somewhere else. Wow. Until they board the ship. And they didn't know their mission until about two weeks after boarding the ship. That's wild. Yeah. So, again, not set up for success. No. That's putting it lightly, honestly. All right. So, there was God, there was fecal matter in their well water, Galvin said. Food and other basic supplies were tough to come by at first. Their lack of internal support personnel meant they were dependent on others, on other units for help, and caused a great deal of frustration for everyone. The Marine, the Marines in Marsox celebrated first combat deployment, who by their own admission were hungry to see some action, were essentially orphaned in the war zone with no resources and no clear guidance. The court determined and Fox, co- Fox Company routinely found itself at odds with the senior army officers to whom they reported. Eesh. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty bad. What a nice situation. Yeah, not a pleasant place to be. So they set out on an approved mission at 6 a.m. on March 4th. So they're hungry for action and they've set out on this approved mission 
keeping in mind they've got really horrible conditions that they've been living in for a good bit. Um, they hadn't been in country for even a month yet. Am I reading that correct? Correctly? Yeah, they haven't, I haven't been there a month yet. So, okay. Well, I mean, that's common. Like, you, you get the ground running. Like, Okay. See, yeah. I don't know as much as no, you do. No, the fact you're already going out on missions, that's not surprising. That's not unusual. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. But, right. like, you also have to remember, like, m- most, uh, I'm going to say it, most of the time you get an AO and that's your AO for the deployment, if not, you know. So they haven't got to learn really like learn their AO yet, learn the populace, uh, meet. And I'm not saying they haven't met them by this point, but they haven't got to build a relationship or rapport with the village elders by this month. They may have met them before, but, you know, obviously first month, seventh month, you know these people a little different. Yeah, so they're not there yet. Uh, Bati Khat district of Afghanistan is where they're where they were sent. In Nagahar province, yeah. Nagahar so, province. Uh, okay. It's a border. It borders Pakistan. Yeah. That's always a problem oh, as yeah. far as just danger. Like that's that's where they're funneling everybody in from because we're not in Pakistan. Yeah. So you know that's a safe haven for them, kind of like Vietnam oh. and Laos. Like they just go to Pakistan, do whatever the heck they want, and then when they're ready, just. Come Sneak back. on over and yeah, so anything okay. that borders Pakistan, you can bet is going to be a hot zone uh, for a deployment. All right. So yeah. after spending, yeah, after spending time patrolling, so the, the, the purpose of their patrol was to go and find um, future re, uh, insertion points for missions. So out there, re- reconning that area for that, they you know spent a while out there. The third, so they're and they're also operating as a platoon. The whole company wasn't out for this particular mission. Okay. Where this incident takes mm-hmm. place. So 30 Marines are out on this mission. After doing all this, they decide to go visit the local elders I was talking about. So they go, they're in route to that, and that's when they were ambushed. Um, this thing was set up pretty good. There was a good bit of fighters involved, but it was initiated by a suicide born. Uh, IED, so our mm. SV bit, S V B I E D, suicide vehicle born IED. Okay. So this thing rolls up, I think it was between the point vehicle and the second vehicle, but it just pretty much engulfs those two vehicles mm. in a big ball of flame. And then boom, things kick off. Okay. Um and you have to remember this patrol, although it's two thousand six, they're still rolling around in Humvees. Their armor isn't what we'd see today, but their armor mint is top grade. Like they've got, mm-hmm. not to mention their small arms, which would include, you know, M4s, uh, 249s, all 556 five, ammo. Things we see, you know, when you go to a range anywhere, wherever you're at, like that's stuff you pick up. But they've also got the 240s, which is a little bigger caliber. They've got, uh, Ma Deuces, so 50 cal machine guns. Those are pretty big size rounds to be going in the country. Co- but, uh, yeah. and I'm not knocking this, like, this is just commonplace. I'm just trying mm-hmm. to paint this picture for everybody. And then Mark 19s, which are belt fed automatic grenade launchers. Uh, mm. Yeah, it sounds as, or well, it's as cool as it sounds. Okay. Like, just a machine gun that is lobbing 40 millimeter grenades. Grenades. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, 30 man platoon like they're armed to the teeth so when this ambush kicks off like they do what they've been trained to do right wow okay all right so afghans who claim to have witnessed the attack stated that the marines panicked after the explosion and opened fire on everything and everyone in sight these claims were also accompanied by accusations of marines seeming drunk and some dismounting their vehicles to threaten local journalists who were taking photographs of their carnage. So that's not sounding very good right now. Mm -mm. After the Marines left the scene, a total of 20 bodies were counted, with the Marines having sustained only a single injury. So... Not a good look. I mean, you hear about this happening, and Mm -hmm. it kind of taps back into that level of professionalism. Mm -hmm. Uh if you haven't seen Generation Kill, I 
it was on, what did we watch on Hulu? Which I know it's not there now. No, I think we watched that on HBO. Well, no, I think it's still on HBO. Okay. If you have HBO, watch it. If you don't, buy the DVDs. Like I told Megan we watched I, It is the best depiction of Marines. Like, real, you know, movies try to do it all the time, but like they hit it on the head with it. And uh, it's it follows some recon Marines. Uh, in Iraq earlier in the invasion, but it is just, they they knock out of the park with it. It's based on a book, actually, but it's a really good show, even a miniseries. There it is. It's a good miniseries. It's a miniseries yeah. But where was I going with that? Oh, remember how the reservists come in? And, like, they're just, I'm going to say messing stuff up, but, like, they're just... Like we talked about earlier, it's almost like there's just teenagers running the show because they're yeah. just killing anything and everything. Yeah. And so when you hear about an ambush happening and there's a bunch of dead civilians afterward, that's not like, oh, wow. But when you hear about, I guess, the, the lack of, of fire discipline yeah. with special forces, you know, members of the SOCOM community, you're like, what the heck? That, like, that doesn't really check out. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, 20 bodies are counted after this incident. That you know, and this is reported straight to. I, I don't know what file these these locals went to to report all this. Yeah. But you know that gets reported pretty quick. Um, I know, something that added to the 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 issue here was, and you're gonna see some characters who play just a really crappy role. Um, an intelligence an intelligence officer. He was a Marine Major Scott Ukele. So he's Foxtrot's lace on to CJSOTF. So he's kind of in the little, um, what's that thing called? Back on the fob, like the little Intel hub hmm. where they have all, you know, they've got drone cameras in there probably. They've got all the big radios. That way everyone can communicate to each other. But it's just kind of like a HQ, if you will. Okay. So he's their lace on in there. Um and I should have looked up what that acronym stands for. So when you get the chance, go Google Charlie, Juliet, Sierra, Oscar, Tango, Foxtrot. Uh, so he's in there when this ambush is called in. And he was OFP. He mm-hmm. was doing his own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so he heard the call come in. And this is all part of, you know, testimonies and trial. Yeah. Because you know, there was investigation, obviously. Yeah, obviously. He went to the break room. So, really? Yeah, he heard Marines under attack. That's and, a good good time for coffee. Yeah, I need a coffee break. Uh, upon Foxtrot's return, so they get back from this ordeal. Mm. He was sent a secure email, which wasn't responded. Ew. Secure phone call, didn't answer. Ew. Finally, I guess they had just you know, some personal cell phones, little burner phones. Mm-hmm. He answers that, and he's just still chilling like <laughs> as really? if nothing ever happened he's just making he's the best confusing. of it there's also side articles on this guy and it sounds like him and his do they call him an assistant or whatever it sounds like they took advantage of not being the boots on the ground you know because they were you know out there to support marsock but it sounds yes. like they were just not doing their job ofp Good yep. Lord. Okay. All right. So when it came to being with charged with negligent homicide, seven Marines were under the radar. Army Colonel John Nicholson wasted no time addressing the Pentagon press corps via satellite that the event was a stain on our honor and using U.S. dollars to pay reprimands. AF Colonel. <laughs> he is AF. Uh Air Force. <laughs> Air Force. Sorry. He's was, Colonel AF. I was like, what does that stand for? I'm sorry. Okay. Air Force Colonel Patrick Pihana. Piana. Piana. Yeah. Attempted to unsuccessfully convince an Army explosive expert to reverse his determination that MARSOC vehicle damage was caused by incoming small arms fire. The investigating officer elected not to include the expert statement in his final assessment. Right. And this ties mm-hmm. into, and I think you may be reading between the lines now, mm-hmm. if you haven't heard the name Eddie Gallagher, 
that's probably a story you want to listen to. And when I should have looked up, there's a podcast I just got done listening to where he's on it talking yeah, about his I've experience. I've heard a little bit of it. Yeah, I'm yeah. upset. But I think the, the host that shows a seal as well, I'm so sorry that I don't have. But go yeah. Google it, Eddie Gallagher podcast. It's great. Um, but yeah, so Eddie, Eddie Gallagher was talking about when they went into his house the entire his entire investigation they just so we touched on this i think on episode two but how the judicial system that we know in the civilian world Mm -hmm. you have rights and just there's a whole due process that does not exist at all in the military world so they would literally just make up it was he said it was like throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing what sticks they would just get as much crap as they could Mm -hmm. thrown out there. And that way, surely, out of everything, something would stick. And so you kind of see that here with these guys. They're just trying to make as much of these investigators or whoever's responsible. And this Colonel Piana guy, Mm -hmm. very frustrating character. He goes in there and actually talks about he questioned these Marines and never... Let them know why, you know, because there is an after action report for everything. Yeah. He just went in there and was like, all right, like just played it cool as if everything's nonchalant. There's nothing to worry about. Got statements from them and then was trying to use those statements against them. Wow. While whilst, as you just read, trying to cover up evidence. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Media reports were published before the smoke even settled. That's not good. Look at this next line. ATV. No, eight. <laughs> sorry. A-t- A-t- sorry, let me slow down because it sounds like I'm saying ATV yeah. like a four wheeler. Uh, those of you fellow Texans, a TV in the Chow Hall was covering the story before the after actions reports were finalized. That's not good. Right. Within days, Fox Company, all 120, were ordered out of the war zone under a cloud of shame. Galvin was stripped of command. Yeah. Mm. Concerns of retaliation, health setbacks due to stress, marriages collapsed. Three to four. Three three out of four four of the guys who were married prior to the deployment. Their marriages did not Their marriages did not make it through that. Depression, substance abuse, and substance abuse, excuse me, and careers tainted. That's so sad. It's so much just... Terrible stuff happening here. Still a stigma in 2018 when a five-part news article was written. So, I mean, even in that late, there's still stuff being discussed about this. Yeah. They, uh, they but, can't get away from it. Yeah. So, almost all of them ended up... And I didn't mention any names. The only reason we mentioned their company commander's name is that dude is a stud. He's a hoss. And he is a, a focal point of that five-part Marine Corps Times during a five-part story on this whole incident that you can you know obviously go read more about but yep uh major galvin just absolute stud took care of his marines before during and after that deployment and it is no doubt due to his diligence and hard work and just sacrifice and never giving up that they were able to eventually eventually after a long hard battle be exonerated of all those crimes. So they were completely fabricated. Really? The, the, yep. The bodies that were found yeah. was a Taliban tactic to drag corpses. Now, whether they killed themselves or they found due to other incidents, but at the end of the day, these, these professionals, they are absolutely professionals. And I feel kind of guilty that we spent some of this podcast, you know, in essence, tricking y'all, but they could count for the guys they killed in an ambush. It wasn't just the IED. It was a prepared, a well-planned ambush. ambush. And they, the guys could attest for the individuals that they killed. So they knew they hadn't killed those people. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it was uh, seven combatants they had actually killed. They had actually had killed in self-defense. Correct. But the Taliban came in. And besides, not only did they bring bodies to the scene, yeah. but they also shot up some vehicles. They obviously gathered all the weapons mm. 
mm-hmm. that were there. It, it was very much uh, kind of a rendition of what's that movie with a uh, oh my gosh Samuel Jackson, right? Remember he's a he's a Marine Colonel and they open fire on this these people. They they rescuing who's the bald guy who played uh an a- Annie the newer one. The newer one. Oh. Really, There's been two newer ones. I don't know oh. which one. I think Harry Connick Jr. Look, was the most look, recent, and I don't think that's what you're talking about. What would you call him? Harry Connick Jr.? I don't know names. I he don't played think, in Lucky okay. Number Slevin. Let me Google his picture so you can see. And I think I'm correct on that. There might be somebody listening going, well, no, I don't, he didn't. I don't need to know the aunt. Well, it wasn't Annie I was trying to figure out. It's the. Well, I know, but I'm trying to try to see if this. I'm going to try to see if this actor is who you're talking about. That's not him, right? No. Okay. I thought that guy was a singer. He's an actor and a singer. Oh, well, it's Rules of Engagement. My mother could tell you all about him. Uh, Rules of Engagement. You remember that movie? It also has... Okay, what's this yeah, guy's it's name? back to me. I think I've seen it like one time. Oh, oh, we just talked about this ago. guy and something else. Did we? Let me see. This guy. Not Samuel Jackson. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, right? Isn't that his name? Well, I think that's Samuel L. Jackson you're showing me. Th- you don't think that's Samuel Jackson? No. <laughs> <laughs> you were, I like that you were pointing to the other one. I'm like, how are you getting There's these two confused? men. If I call one Samuel Jackson, okay, one Tommy Lee Jones. Listeners, listeners. There was another picture that it looked like his finger was pointing at. I could not even see the picture with Tommy Lee Jones in it. His finger was covering it, and he was pointing to the only picture that I could see, which was of Samuel L. Jackson. And I yes, I was concerned that you didn't know the difference between the two. Between so just for the <laughs> record, Megan thought this is how this is the, the your finger was covering the Tommy level Lee, jo- I am, Tommy Lee Jones. In, in your mind, I didn't know the difference between Tommy Lee concerned. Jones and Samuel Jackson. I'm telling you, I was concerned. Your finger was covering his face. And to be fair, I think it should also be made aware that like you are not great with names. <laughs> And remembering people. You know why I'm not? Because when I'm right on the money, this happens. Is that That's why? why. No. Oh, yeah. Evidence. I'm not taking I would like to put this audio evidence into court. No. So, wow. Yes, rules of engagement. They, okay. They, yes, rules they, of engagement. A lot of people are killed, and they do a great job displaying it because you're like, oh, maybe you did murk a bunch of Yeah, you really do but think it could have happened. Anyways, you know, so people killed. Someone went out, took up all the weapons. And they're like, how could they do this? These Marines in cold blood just kill these people. Yeah. But obviously, they were getting shot at. But uh, yeah, these absolute, nothing short of the word professionals were ambushed. And it, and, I'm, and it, let's go back because, you know, when we first pitched it, we're like, man, they killed 20 people. All, you know, one guy got hurt. No, they were just engulfed in a very well organized and executed ambush and only received one casualty i think he took shrapnel or was shot in the, in the arm like he he was okay like yeah he, he didn't die yeah it wasn't but, a casualty he was just injured yeah and yeah they did i mean absolutely what you would expect of the socom community in this instance well and i just want to revisit so they should have probably received some type of commendation or like they should have been acknowledged for their professionalism in the situation. And instead, oh, instead yeah. they are treated like criminals. And again, I'm going to read that part that they had health setbacks because of their stress. Three, uh, three of the four guys that were married, their marriages fell apart. They had depression. Even as late as 2018, they still have this stigma on their shoulders because there was this five-part news article done about this uh, particular incident that I guess was still portraying them as the bad guys. No, is that, no, the five-part no. news article is like oh, doing it's coming an event. back. Because okay, remember, this, this is Marine Corps Times who wrote that. Oh, okay. And when this happened, Marine Corps Times wrote an article. You know, I think it was oh. titled "Meltdown in Marsock," like. How this unit uh, blemished the Corps' reputation. Like, oh, wow. Marine Corps Times was on board with this whole thing. Yeah. But I think it's one of those, like, everyone wants to get, everyone wants to get the story out first. Uh, so they really didn't do their due diligence to find out what happened? Well, or? I think, you know, I don't want to be unfair to them. Like, the information being presented by 
generals and colonels. And I mean, you had this Colonel Pihuha just out there. <laughs> ask, can you imagine asking somebody to lie? Hey, the Humvees had bullet holes in them from the ambush, and this piece of crap was trying to get somebody to say, hey, say that's from something else. Like, that's mm. So sick. it was easily investigated and figured out why then did they do this to these guys if they could investigate and find out that this was not I'm real. not. I'm not going to get into it, but maybe listen to that Eddie Gallagher podcast thing. It's five hours of quality podcast, but... Yeah. Once you get to a certain rank, okay, you are a politician, mm. and you got to, you know. And it just we're talking about better politically decades of a career. You don't want to mess it. So yeah, it's kind of scary to think about who they'll feed to the wolves. Yeah. For the sake of career advancement, and I'm not bashing any anybody in the vi- in particularly but i mean it happens it and this happens. this p hala guys a frustrating example so but yeah it, especially, it, even those that army commander you mentioned mm-hmm. who got on and did a little press conference like without knowing anything you're saying some pretty bold stuff and it pisses me off yeah really does so this was just good for their advancement themselves to get on board with this whole idea that Mar- this Marsoc that they messed up. Oh yeah, for I don't know for whatever reason. That's I don't just know. It, well, and you know what? If you actually go dig into it, and it's touched on that five part article, like this was not done. Like not everyone was accepting of this of Marsoc. Yeah. Like the Marine Corps, oh. the Marine, the tops of the Marine Corps, they didn't want it, and then the SOCOM community didn't want it because that's another mouth to feed. Like it was just there's some bureaucratic garbage okay. that was entailed in it yeah it was a mess so it kind of were would possibly have worked out for a lot of people to make them look bad and maybe like they shouldn't exist i'm not gonna say that's why this happened well, yeah but, but possibly well i mean at reason. the root of it all though you have to understand like if if a village comes up and tells you i mean it's believable i guess and there true. were 20 bodies yeah yeah so like it's not like they just maybe willingly was like, yes, jumped on it. Yeah, yeah, Or were I, I part of the planning of it. Yeah, it was no, the no, Taliban no. that planned yeah, it I, and no, executed I don't think it. they were being malicious. And, I, you know, I feel like I made it. I painted they that just, picture. They just didn't do... Well, that might have been me painting that picture. They just didn't do their due diligence to find the real true story. They just grabbed the first thing that... Well, think about this, sense. though. For whatever reason that Air Force colonel was doing it, like... If you have investigators feeding you lies, That's true. but they're the, you know, they, they, why would, you know what I'm saying? The like AF colonel. Yeah. <laughs> He's Colonel <laughs> AF. Yeah. Like, you know, you really don't have, I don't know, but okay, yeah. it's, uh, and you know what? I feel like a fun part of this, I'd say fun part and a, a An nifty interesting part. part of the podcast itself is getting to, I I try to do as good as I can as get, gathering information on the individuals involved. Yeah. But after looking, I feel like I looked almost as long to gather information on the individuals mm-hmm. as I did the rest of it. Coming up, I've ended up finding three out of seven names. Between the fact a lot of these guys are still operating, whether in Marsoc or a sister SOCOM community, or some of them are actually working, like, in government agencies, uh, whether it be the ATF, DEA, whatever. Like, so some of them, their identities are, have to be kept secret anyways, but I I finally was like, you know, it was so hard to find these names, and they are innocent of the crimes they were charged with. Like, you know what, I'm just going to redact their names from this whole story. That was probably wise. But, again... Uh, Major Galvin, he's an absolute stud. He's a big part of that five-part article. Yeah. So Definitely go read that article. And there was another podcast by a Marine. He was recon at the time, but just kind of the way Marsoc was created, he was friends with a lot of these Marsoc guys. And he does, he has a, an episode. Sorry, I didn't find that name. But I think if you search Task Force Violent, um, it, you'll see this guy has long hair and a beard, but he talks about 
he actually got to go visit their compound when you know because he was in country at the same time with his recon unit went to go visit his buddies yeah. and he saw the humvees all shot up mm. and but he had already heard the story before he got there from what i remember on the episode just go check it out but he was like yeah this this is crap yeah this is not adding up so it wasn't that hard to find out to like do some due diligence and like really go through and find out what truly happened yeah at the end of the day yeah so these are some some marines who were serving their country who really got pooped on hard yeah yeah to sum it up in a very eloquent way yeah that stinks so but yeah you had me going uh there for a while like i thought we were i didn't know what the twist was going to be i thought we were talking about this horrible thing that these marines did because they lost control yeah yeah but they didn't they did what they were supposed to do yeah they're studs man and like i said the exact opposite they should have been rewarded for for what they did this really makes me sad yeah yeah it's one of those things like once they set not them but the powers that be set that thing in motion like it, yeah it really sucked like that was the biggest thing like their first deployment as a unit like first time marsoc did this and that's what and that's what happened they had thrown their face yeah and they actually did a really i just sorry i keep coming back to that maybe it's like i said because i connect with that in my career they did a really good job but they're being portrayed as the they were portrayed as villains yeah. or like somebody who wasn't doing their job um for for too long i guess very sad yeah this made me sad. I need another teacup of whiskey. Well, I think the good <laughs> news is, like, at least I don't think we're going to get many happy endings. Yeah. In this line of podcast. I know. But this is one. This is one that it wasn't really yeah. what it seemed to be. So it is sad, but they did eventually get exonerated. Mm hmm. And, and 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 they 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 didn't kill. It's not like a bunch of civilians were killed. Yes. and they were exonerated. Like they didn't kill civilians, and they were finally and exonerated. they were exonerated. So unlike last week's episode where we were just like, it was horrible because there were civilians killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they didn't do it. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of 